Before dawn, a time when dreams are as drowsy as nectar, as sweet as honey. In the sky, the stars are fading as the light grows. But Hecabe, queen of Troy, King Priam's wife, does not stir from her deep slumber. Dreams fall upon her as she sleeps. Like dew upon the morning grass, her eyes, fluttering beneath their lids, throng with images which only the gods or their messenger Hermes, the bringer of dreams, can make sense of. In a matter of hours, Ekabi will be delivered of a second child, a second son. Yet she takes no joy in the life swelling in her womb and longing to be born. Her heart weeps because the child's father, her husband Priam, who built this great city, does not love her. Even in sleep, her spirit cries out to heaven for heaven's justice. I am Hermes, the son of Zeus. And the goddess Maya, I come out of the air, like fire or thought, to serve the gods, of whom no testimony exists beyond the minds of mortal men and women. I trouble the wakeful with dreams, and I bring to the afflicted voices and visions. When. They see what cannot be seen, or hear what is forbidden, or think they have glimpsed some image, some reflection of eternity. Then truly it is said that a god is walking beside them. Who are you? I am the god Hermes. Why do you come? I come because you have need of me. Will the child I carry be a boy? Yes. He will live, and grow strong and healthy. I dream that with his birth, my life on earth will end. You will die, the moment he is born. <gasps> I am content. Often in my prayers, I have offered my life to Zeus. If only Zeus will give me a second son. I did this out of love, for Priam's sake. But Priam does not love me. Lord, tell me this: Will you punish Priam after my death for the way he has treated me? Is this what you desire, Hecabe? Yes. But do the gods hear our prayers? Do they listen to our innermost thoughts, or are the gods themselves and everything they teach only the shadow which the mind casts like a fire when it dreams or sleeps? Priam puts no faith in fate or gods or dreams or prophecies. He says that men stand on the earth on their own two feet and are master or servant according to their nature. Priam is the greatest king on earth. He has built a city with twelve tall gates and walls of granite, which are fifteen paces wide. But it was I who gave him the strength to do what had to be done. In the first winter of our marriage, 
The wooden city which Priam's father had built on the estuary of the river Scamander was sacked by invaders from the Greek mainland. Priam raised an army, and after a single battle he drove the enemy into the sea. He took no prisoners. They died on the beaches where they stood or were drowned. Then Priam rebuilt the city. He hardly slept. I had to force him to eat. He shouted, I am a king, Hecabe, and a king worth the name sees that his men are fed first. I answered, without you there'll be nothing, these people. Eat. And so he ate. I see that once you loved this man and honoured him. Yes, I loved him then. That year at harvest time, our first child, Hector, was born. Priam nicknamed him Hector the Long-Faced. Hector would laugh. He would not be strange and tongue-tied in his father's presence if Priam spent more time with him. I hope that if I could give him a second son, then he would love me again as he once did. There was a time when all he lived for was to please me. He taught me how to love him. He wore me like a brooch. But I am no longer young. My brow is lined. My thick black hair will soon be white. Priam has taken from me my youth, my hope, my beauty. Yet in his heart, he knows what all men know. One day he will come back to me, but I will not give him what he needs and wants from me. I will reject him. <laughs> Do not weep, Hecabe. The gods love you, and they will deal justly with you. You must not be afraid. I do not fear death, Lord. Only the pain of dying. Life is nothing, Hecabe. A bubble upon an ocean of silence. A star in an infinite darkness. Strength, youth and beauty dissolve into the past and are lost like smoke. But the spirit does not die as a flame dies. It lives and burns forever with a light which is immortal and more brilliant than the sun. I hear your voice so clearly, Lord. But when I wake, I will forget who you are and what you have said to me. No, you will not forget. When you wake, Priam will be at your side. You will think this is a dream. But it is not a dream. Remember. Look, the moon has set, and the cool of the dawn prepares the earth for the day's heat. I watch the walls of the city grow bright as the constellations fade. The Pleiades, Orion, the Great Bear. They melt into the glare like drops of water dissolving upon sand. Hekabi, my beloved wife, is near her time. Each evening, so her women say, she weeps. If she loses the child, it will be my fault. I am Priam. I am King of Troy. Priam? I am here, Hikabi. I have waited for you a long time. I understand, but I could not come sooner. You are pale. The child will be born tonight, Priam. Your women say it will be three more days. You're wrong. Let me touch you. Is my hand cold? Yes, a little. A healthy child. I can feel it kick. He's going to be a boy. How can you know that? What else for a man like you? Mm, I hope so. 
The king is not secure with girls. A king needs boys. How can I give you boys if I never see you? Ah, Hakabi. I know I have neglected you. I know it has hurt you. But I cannot always be here in Troy at my wife's side. My work is hard. Harder than you can imagine. You know well that in my father's time, Troy was a barren country, half desert and half marsh. Our enemies stole corn and cattle from us as it pleased them, while we fought amongst ourselves. I organized the people of this nation for the first time in their history. I imposed strong laws and put an end to the factional quarreling of petty village chieftains. I caused the marshes to be drained and the desert to be irrigated. Now the land is fertile, and the tribes which once owed allegiance only to themselves are proud to call themselves Trojans. They acknowledge one language, one coinage, one law. Make a home for me, Hakabe. I cannot lead the mild and gentle life of a woman. Hypocrite. When you want comfort, you take it wherever you find it. If I behaved as you do, you would renounce me. For years, I've had to stomach your wretched infidelities. The absences which you said were caused by your work, but which your wife understands well enough. I know you, Priam. I loved you once because you were ruthless and cruel. Because you never hesitated. Because your dreams were full of grace and energy, strength and daring. Because your body was everything I desired. But I am tired of you now. Sick of your casualness and your arrogance. The way you always ignore my fears, my unhappiness. The way you always think that weakness is contemptible. Pray heaven, something you love is taken from you. Pray heaven, there is something you want but cannot get. What are you saying? I am saying that the birth will be violent. The child will tear me open the moment he tastes the air. You are wrong. I am not wrong. Dreams invade my sleep. I can't shut them out. I see the gods. I see things which I cannot put into language. I dream of a flame issuing from my body which devours all of Troy, which leaves nothing except parched earth, blackened rock. What you see when you dream is only the image of your own fear. Do not be frightened of shadows. If I have made you angry, think of the past and of the good times we have known. Remember the night this boy was conceived and how I loved you then. I remember well the night this boy was conceived. Priam had been absent for many days, but he sent no word to me. As he had promised. <laughs> I waited for him until the moon had set, and when he did not come, I cursed him. And the hour before dawn, a man, or the image of a man, stood before my bed. I think now it was the god, and not Priam, who came to me that night and planted this child inside me. I think in his fickleness the god took pity on me because he knew how my body ached and how my mind was full of longing. When at last I awoke, Priam was beside me. Wine had helped him to a deep sleep. I did not wake him, but went out into the garden alone, where I gave thanks to the goddess Aphrodite for her gifts of love and fruitfulness. <laughs> oh, oh, Priam, what have you done to me? Because you did not love me and my body could not please you, the god has entered me. He will give you a son whose soul will never be tempered by a mother's softness and love. <laughs> Who will be not a child, but a great, tempestuous fire, a bloody and devouring flame?
as death approaches, the mind becomes simpler, and the heart, free of fear, accepts and acknowledges the gods. Who are you? I speak the words of the gods. What do you want with me? Your son has been born, Priam. He is safe and healthy, but your wife is dead. Dead? She is dead, Priam. The eager boy in her womb was too rough for her. I loved her. When she was alive, you took little account of her. How dare you say that? Am I a liar? No. You speak the truth. I wronged her. There is something else that you must know. As the soul left her body, it cried out, O oh heaven, O oh earth, this child is like a fire inside me. I am giving birth to a flaming torch. I am sent to warn you that if the child does not die, then you, your city and its people will all be destroyed. The words Hakabi spoke in her final agony would be proved a prophecy. Troy will burn. Do you ask me to kill my own son? The gods themselves ask it. Then the gods are not the gods. You do not know what you are saying. I know what I am saying. Is the future decided already? My wife lies dead. Why do you compound the loss by asking me to murder her child? I do not know what the gods are or what heaven is. I only know that there is no doctrine which will make a man good except his own good deeds. We should not study the entrails of sacrificial birds or the patterns which the constellations make. A man serves the gods best by a mild and merciful life. Do you talk to me of mildness and mercy? You who have bound your people upon pain of death to obey your laws and keep your commandments? I am Priam, king of Troy. I do not slaughter children. You think because you have built a city and brought order and prosperity to your tribe that you are lord of the earth. You are wrong. Gods are above kings. That is why you say that the gods are not the gods. The gods do not want the things you want. That is why you oppose them. All your life you have hated the world's contingent disasters. Nothing contented you until you had mastered it. When Troy was destroyed in your father's time, you despised your father for allowing it to happen. You have always loathed stupidity and incompetence. You have always known what other men should do. Your tribe lived for centuries between marsh and desert upon a narrow strip of land. You despised them because they never attempted to drain the marshes or irrigate the desert. You were the first to do it. You made yourself king, but the gods are above you. Where were the gods when my people died each winter of starvation? Where were they when the summer heat withered our harvest and famine was followed by pestilence? There are no limits to human misery, but here in Troy, the laws I make have curbed its worst excesses. This does not deserve an answer, Priam. Do you hold the gods to account for every failure and accident of nature? But since you are obdurate, I shall trouble you no further. Wait. I will make a bargain with you. I cannot see into the future, but if you can, then take the boy yourself and do with him as you think fit. 
This I am prepared to sanction to prove to you what you deny, that I fear the gods and respect the unseen and invisible mysteries of heaven. I beg you to spare his life, but if you will not, then carry him up above the snow line in his wattle cradle. Leave him out in the open, in the cold, as the night comes on. If he does not die quickly of exposure, the eagle or the bear or the wolf will soon kill him. Nature respects nothing except strength, and there is no creature more helpless than a newborn child. Do to him whatever you judge to be best, but I will not wield the sacrificial knife. Very well, Priam. I will do as you say although it is not what I asked. You have often declared that men make their own luck. Do not forget what has happened here today. Could I forget? A child was born here, but no sound, no trace of him remains. He has gone into the air with this man who came like a shadow. If the gods permit this boy to live, sixteen years will pass before he is himself a man. On that day, whether he is living or dead, I will honor his memory. I will sacrifice at the altar in the temple of Apollo a milk-white bull with no blemish or mark upon him. I will give the life of this spotless creature as an offering to the gods in memory of the son who was lost to me when his mother died. Let the gods see by this that I love my city more than the life of my son. Let them therefore protect and honor it as their own. city of Troy, and went with the child into the wild country near the slopes of Ida, the holy mountain. There I abandoned him at the mouth of a cave. The stories are still told in this region of how he was rescued by a shepherd called Anacreon, who had gone up one morning before dawn into the mountains to search for a sheep which was lost. Instead, he found, lying in the lair of a she-bear, a little naked boy whom he clothed and fed, and to whom he gave the name Paris. As Paris grew slowly to speech, he found that he could hear in the cries of cattle or sheep which ox or heifer was strong, which animal to put to stud, and which to kill for winter feed. He knew these things without being taught by his own shrewdness and stillness, and by the voices which the gods brought to his mind in dreams. As he grew, he also knew that it was time to set free a thing within him which was like fear or longing. He caught it and won Inone, a village girl. Soon they were lovers, sleeping out in the open, under the summer stars, not minding the dew coming down at nightfall, or the noise of cow bells waking them at dawn. Then when the storms came on, they had Anacreon's little hut, which kept the weather out. But nothing lasts. Everything changes. The winter following was the hardest for many generations. 
Every animal which Paris and his father could not afford to feed, they killed and ate except one, a fine young bull calf, whom Paris has reared himself since the mother died, wrapping it at night for warmth inside a blanket and giving it to eat only the best and sweetest grasses. It is in this animal, and not in Inone, his lover, that Paris puts all his trust. Some say that the gods control the actions of men, but what men do begins as thought, not action. fading. It'll be light soon, and the day will be hot. Where are you going? Up to the high pastures. Two of my new wattle fences already need mended. Last night I was kept from sleep. I feared that one of the animals would escape. I must get the work done before the sun reaches its height. You wake so early each morning. You go up into the hills before it is light. You think I am still asleep, but I watch you as you dress. I long to give you children to help you. Why will you not marry me as you have promised? I have denied you nothing. What more must I do to make you happy? I long to be yours openly in the eyes of the world, so no one will whisper that I am shameless and have no modesty, or that I sleep with you only to make you stay. Why did you woo me and make me love you if you cared nothing for me? Inoni, why do you quarrel? Everything I do, I do for you. But I have sworn not to marry until I am sufficient and secure. Oh, I have told you this often, but you do not listen. Can a woman protect a man? Can she put him beyond the reach of misfortune or illness or the malice of other men? You talk of love, but the world is as it is. In it, the good man suffers, and the evil man goes free. Only the strong survive. Consider Anacreon, my father. For fifty years he stood tall and straight as a pine. But now that old age has whittled away his bodily strength, he must be left to starve unless I work to help and care for him. Your father did his work in daylight, but you rise long before dawn. My father was contented if each year was the same as the one before it. But I cannot be happy unless each day I have striven in some measure to improve my condition. One day soon, you know me, I will be the master of a large farm, and men who are herdsmen as I am now will work under me as my servants. How can you know that? I have had dreams. Well, tell me. No, you know me. Put dreams into words and they make no sense. Come quickly, my son. There are two strangers on horseback approaching our home. They came up at dawn on the track which leads from Troy. When I glimpsed them first, they were 300 paces distant, moving among the pines and cedars. The one who leads is no more than 19 years of age, but the other is darker, heavier. At his side there hangs a sword belt of soft leather studded with silver, and over his shoulder a nobleman's cloak trimmed with fur. Uh, don't fret yourself, father. I'll go out and see what they want. I don't like and I don't trust faces I don't recognize. Good morning, gentlemen. Not seen you two before. Have you come far? We come from Troy upon the king's business. And any insolence will be answered with this. What is your name? So my name is Paris. We need water for our horses. Oh, your horses may drink from my well. My lords, will you eat and drink with us? We have goat cheese, loaves of new-baked bread and cakes of barley... We will accept your hospitality. My name is Hector. I am Priam's son and the heir to his throne. The man who rides beside me is Achilles, Prince of Thessaly. Oh, sirs, I was born here in the hills under the shadow of Ida, and all my life I have never made a journey more distant from this spot than a day's ride by ox cart. I have heard no word spoken of any nation called Thessaly. It is a wooded country far across the sea, thick with pine forests. 
where to hunt and fight is as natural as to eat or drink. Those who inhabit there trust to nothing except their skill with bow or javelin. Peleus is my father's name, a famous warrior and king who carries imprinted upon his body the mark of thirty-nine wounds, which he, a master of warfare, sustained with glory in the service of the gods and country. Yet, although I am proud to call myself his son, resembling him in much, my birth was not mortal, as his assuredly was. I am the child of a goddess, a spirit of the ocean depth. She is Thetis, daughter of Zeus. Sirs, this is the best of what we have. So why have you come out of your own country across the wide sea to Troy? Well, Prime has said, if men are shown the highest and best, surely they will choose it. Accordingly, I sent to Priam, saying, Sir, the people of Troy make bold to call their city the image of heaven, the garden of God. Let me see it for myself, by living among you. Why the whole earth reveres its name? Priam answered, I cannot refuse a young man who desires to learn. Come. What have you learned? That the city can be stronger than the tribe. The city is not walls or ramparts or a marketplace. The city is an idea. A king may take by force any woman. He may condemn without trial any man, and so, without cause or motive, commit any crime. But the city, binding itself under its own laws, does none of these things. Yet it possesses a strength as great as the greatest king. Priam is supreme because the people of Troy will fight and die, not for Priam alone, but for the liberty to call themselves Trojans, giving up their lives for what is no more than a name. Oh, you say it is no more than a name, but before my father's time it did not exist. By giving justice, my father touches the lives of every man and woman. Although these two have never set eyes upon Priam, my father, yet their days have been spent free from war and the threat of war. I have never seen Troy or its great marketplace. I've never trodden the road which leads beyond these hills, out of these meadows sweet with summer flowers. But I have heard how, in my father's time, your father's men cut down the woods and burned the tall grasses which covered the plain. They built roads and raised walls of stone where cedars and larches once stood and hunted the stag and the boar, not out of need, but for the pleasure of it. What is your name? Sir, my name is Inoni. You are this boy's wife? We are betrothed, sir. We met last summer, bringing in the harvest. You will make a good couple. Well, men are not handsome for long. Their bodies become wrinkled or marked, or as fat as pies. But a man halfway between boyhood and manhood is beautiful for a short time. There is a bull standing alone, in the lower field separated from the other cattle by a wooden partition. His pelt is milk white, his flanks as shiny as any thoroughbred horse. Tell us, who owns him, you or your father? So the bull is mine. I'm charged to ask what price you will sell him for. We will offer you in payment 400 talents, a sum higher than any marketplace will yield. Why? And what will you do with him? Brian will sacrifice him at the altar of Apollo to purify the city and bring to its people the prosperity and long life which is promised to those who honor the God. Sir, I'm sorry that whatever you offer, I cannot accept. To me, this animal is beyond price. How so? He's only a bull. <coughs> Sir... I have an eye for the qualities of cattle and take pride in being correct in my predictions. Better breeding stock than this you will not find in the life of a generation. That is why I reared him myself, fed and nursed him with my own hands and at my own cost. It was an investment which I had the foresight to make against an uncertain future. The price you offer me in compensation will not buy me what I shall lose by accepting it. So as I am a herdsman, each day of my life I must labour in barn or in cattle buyer in low-lying meadow or high hill pasture until my body is worn to the bone, yet I do this not to be rich or for the satisfaction I take in the task, but to be spared starvation, to eat in safety by my own hearth, to sleep sheltered from the weather, and at the end when I've toiled away the youth and the strength of a lifetime to earn these meagre pleasures, how will the gods reward me? Well, they will give me what they give indiscriminately to every man and woman, old age, sickness and death. Therefore, sirs, do not laugh at me when I say that all the hope and ambition of a young man's dream is in this animal. If you take him from me, then you condemn me to live out my life in utter poverty. Others of your kind do so and are contented. 
No, they do so because they must. We've been patient long enough with this argumentative boy. Yes, the time for words is over. What you have refused to sell us, we're empowered to take from you by force. If you obstruct us, we will cut you down. We gave you opportunity enough to make yourself rich and even to earn the favor of the King of Troy himself. But you have preferred another way, a way of stubbornness and pride. If you try to take what is mine, I shall do as any man would do. Fight until either you are defeated or I am dead. Boy, be warned. I know how to cause a man to strike at me in rage so that I may use the excuse of provocation to kill him. We have done you no harm. Why are you treating us with such disdain? Where is your gentleness and courtesy? Madam, we came here in peace to carry out the orders of the king, but this boy has refused the fair price we offered and sought a quarrel. No, it is you who have made the quarrel. It is easy to be a tyrant to a poor man who has not the means to defend himself. Why do you boast to me of your strength? It is only the power to steal. I am no tyrant. You do not know what tyranny means. My father is a great man. I do nothing he would not approve. Does he know what you do to his good name by thieving from the poorest of his people? Be silent! If we were any of the things you say we are, you would not be living now to say them. Oh, kill me then! Huh? I am poor. I have nothing. This bull which you are stealing is everything to me. The gods give us life. They give it freely and generously. But you make a world where men have no more divinity than the ox which is harnessed to the plough. You rage at us, boy, but what angers you is this, that your birth and parentage bind you to the earth. Yet prove to me that you are fit to live free as a free man, and I will advance you. If you are certain that your cause is right, then follow us to Troy and put it to the test. Speak before Priam as you have spoken to us. Stand as an appellant in Priam's Hall of Judgment. He made the law for men such as you. He loves it more than you love yourself. But if you have not so much courage, then live upon the earth as a creature of the earth and be contented. What will you do? I will follow them to Troy. Then you are leaving me. I have no choice, you know me. No, it is what you want to do. Everything I wanted and planned for us both goes with them into Troy to perish under the sacrificial knife to please ceremony and the gods. Do you not know me better, you know me, than to ask me to accept what I can fight to change? No, Paris, you are leaving me. I did not bring these men to our cottage. You must blame the gods for that, not me. What have the gods to do with this? I have had a dream. Tell me. It is hard to put it into words. Oh, you do not lack the power of speech and have always been quick to condemn whatever offended you. In my dream, I found myself lifted up high into heaven where I stood before Zeus himself, the father of the gods. Boy, he said to me, I am told that there is no one living now on earth who can better judge the qualities of sheep and cattle than Paris, the herdsman's son. I bowed my head to him and answered, What you have heard is true, my lord. He replied, Then prove it to me. At once he clapped his hands. At once, as if the curtain of the clouds had suddenly been torn in two, three women appeared to me, walking upon the air. They were golden-skinned and sculpted out of light. And in their eyes, or so it seemed to me, there lay a promise of immortal satisfaction. These whom you see, said Zeus, are goddesses. Hera, my wife, and my daughters Athene and Aphrodite. But pay no attention, please, to their high estate. I ask you to assess them as you see them, for their grace, for their beauty, and most of all for this, their power to awaken the masculine in men. Look carefully at each one, then judge, if you can, which of the three deserves most to bear the title, the loveliest of all? Well, I said to each disrobe, if I'm to judge you for your beauty, then I must see you naked as a lover would. 
Aphrodite smiled as she put aside her clothes, saying, What do you know of love? You are a boy, but I can make you a man. You will lie contented in my arms and never again desire to be a child. Give me what is due to me. In me, everything is fulfilled. At this, Hera, the eldest and the tallest of the three, let slip the garment she wore, and as her russet hair fell almost to her waist, she laughed, saying, Boy, do not believe these flatteries. Only wealth and power can give a man the freedom to be a man. Power is the doorway to all other satisfactions. How else do the gods rule in heaven except by power? Give me the title, and all the earth shall be yours. Athene answered, as she stood naked before me, If you do not see that, in themselves, power and beauty are nothing, then you are a fool. Without wisdom, a life begun in hope and fortune must end in catastrophe. Award the title to me, and you will know at the end that to be one among many is the best and highest for mortal men. And did you choose? No. I understood that by choosing one, I should anger the others. And so I walk in fear before I could make a choice. Yet, who would not want power and wealth if they were poor, as I am? This is no dream, Paris. This is an image of the struggle within your own heart. Oh, my love, I know you well. You see what the best is, but you do not choose it. You are dearer to yourself than any friend or any lover could be. Yet some doubt or guilt, some knowledge of falsehood or false dealing, which you would prefer not to be burdened with, tugs at your mind. For you, the price of doing wrong is to know it and see it clearly. If you leave me now, your soul will never be at peace. No course of action will satisfy your longing. Always your heart will whisper, had I lived my life another way, then perhaps I might have been happy. I knew it but had not the strength to do it. I did not compel you to love me. You accepted me. Yes. You are beautiful, and you offered me love. I was young, and had never known a woman. Did I do wrong to accept what you gave? Go then. Go if you are going. You said that you loved me. Now you talk as if you hate me. You have broken my heart. Inoni is weeping, my son. Why? What is the matter? Hold her up, people, I'm going to Troy. You are not free to leave. You're pledged to marry her. I made her no promises. Do not make me despise you. Do not break my heart as well as hers. Father, I have tried to love her, but I cannot. If you say that you never loved her, then you have deceived me as well as her. I love the beauty, but beauty is not enough. Girls from the village are not beautiful for long. Before they are twenty, you, you see the wrinkles form around the mouth above the eyes. Their shape alters as they eat too much and bear too many children. Is that a reason to leave and go to Troy? I go to Troy, Father, to get back what is mine. If you challenge them again, they will kill you. I'm not afraid. You should be. You are a herdsman. There's nothing in Troy for a man like you. A man has only a single life. Why must I spend it here among cattle and sheep? What can be worse? to leave the space empty between cradle and grave. Now, the tree in the meadow says to me, make me free of the root which holds me and binds me. The fish which I hook out of the stream say to me, send us back to the long wild river where we were happy. The fire climbing in the grate cries out, let me leap up to heaven where everything is heat and light. Oh. 
for God's sake, Cruel. And then they bless me with a son I never hoped to have, and now at the end of my life they take it from me. Father, I do what I must do. I am not your father. It is time that you knew the truth about yourself. I am a herdsman, but you are not a herdsman's son. On the day you were born, your father tried to kill you. He abandoned you in your cradle at the hour of your birth. I found you in the mountains, lying in the lair of a sheep bear. You were warm and pink as a piglet. I have always loved you, but you are not as other children. The people of this village often spoke against you. They did this because they were frightened of you. I have lived a long time, but even I have never understood the things you say you feel and which you see in your dreams. <laughs> Why have you kept this from me? Because I did not want to lose you. My own beloved wife, Eurythily, died giving birth to a baby girl. I buried the girl beside her mother, thinking as I dug the grave that my life was over. Then, only a month later, up in the hills, I found you. <laughs> it was like a miracle after the great grief I had endured. I blessed the gods and began my life again. Oh, oh, father. Whoever my true father is or was, how can I love him as I have loved you? When I walk as a child screaming from nightmares, it was you who comforted me. The people of the village said I was cursed by the gods and would bring ill luck to you and the community, but you would not listen to them. Everything I ever needed you gave to me. Out of love. There is something else. <coughs> In your cradle I found a ring made of gold. I do not doubt that your father intended it to be a payment for whoever might find you. But I was frugal and never needed to sell it. Look. I have kept it for you. It is beautiful. But I shall never sell it. I will wear it always with pride in memory of you. The gods go with you, my son. You have in you now the life I had 50 years ago. Nothing could hurt me more than to hear that you are dead. Remember that. He is gone. I know him too well to think he will ever return. He has taken the light out of the sky. He has made the air thin. He has separated me from everything I loved and wanted. My life is barely begun, yet my good days are over. Never again will he warm his hand at the fire I lit to keep the winter out or eat the food which I prepared for him with such loving care. Never again will I be happy, never laugh, never wake in the morning content and carefree as I used to do when he slept beside me. Nothing lasts. Everything changes. Oh, you gods, do you think that I do not know how foolish it is to make a man a mortal man, the centre of my life and the beat of my heart. But I have tied the knot which I cannot undo. I will make myself a garland of roses and myrtle berries, of hyacinth and the gentle narcissus and the white violet. 
I will make a wreath of the summer's late flowers. They will lie with me in my grave and fade as my beauty fades. I will eat nothing and drink nothing, for I am resolved to die for love of him. Not in only the dark-eyed girl whom Paris the herdsman loved. Paris did not love me. He has left me and gone to Troy. You are very pale. I have not eaten since he left me. I am weak with hunger. Eat then or you will die. I mean to die. The love of him? Yes. What folly. Will he die for you? Do as he has done. Find comfort elsewhere. What comfort has he found in Troy that he could not find in my arms? You do not want to know. Tell me. He challenged Hector in front of Priam, his father. His suit was successful. Hector admitted his fault. Priam believes by the ring that the boy wears that Paris is his own son, who was discarded in his infancy to comply with the prophecy of the gods. Accordingly, your lover, the herdsman's child, is raised up high as a prince among men. So, my fate is sealed. It does not please me to see you weeping. I have no power to give you what you want. But if I could, I would make you happy. You are young. Do not destroy yourself because a man does not love you. I have no choice. I think of nothing except his face, his body. I hear nothing, only his voice calling sweetly to me. You are beautiful. Come with me. Sleep in my pavilion at my side. You will be famous forever as the lover of Achilles. I cannot. You are as good as he is. But you are weak. Be strong. I do not know how. Make your spirit harder. Your need simpler. No. Well, then I cannot help you. I came to Troy to find a companion for the life I mean to live. I sought a brother, but Hector does not feel the touch of honor which I feel. He is not a warrior. His loyalty is to his city. I have no city. I was bred in the woods and have hunted since I could stand. I know only the meadow and the forest and the wide plain and the salt sea shore. There my mother's voice can be heard in the waves, in the wind, in the cry of the wet sea bird. When I am alone and heavy of soul, I stand where the waves meet the land and I listen to her soft sea voice. She tells me that I am born to greatness, yet in my heart I know I shall not live to be old. Oh, be at peace, Achilles. Be happy with a woman. There are many who will love a man like you. Thou <laughs> was not born to be happy. I was born to fight. In this world we destroy or are destroyed. Creatures in the wood kill each other, so why should a man not live by killing other men? What other life? A better way is there than mastering by strength, testing by combat. How do fish live in the sea? By eating each other. How do birds live in the air? A hawk tears the finch. Help me, Achilles. Huh? How? I will do for you whatever lies in my power. Take my life. You have the hands of a warrior. You can kill cleanly in a single movement as the bird catcher kills the bird. Do not let me suffer. 
No, I will not do that. I will not take life promiscuously for its own sake. The gods make this demand of a warrior, that he fights not for his own gain, but for honor, to help the helpless in their affliction, and to free the soul from its captivity. Earth and blood. I think the earth creates for itself what it needs. When it needs blood, it will have blood. If the good man is not also a strong man, then his goodness is spilt like water into the sand. Men say that the gods want men to be good. Yet the earth desires only strength and blood. Everywhere I go, by day or night, there are servants or slaves who attend to my needs. I hold a new world in the palm of my hand. Tell me, child, what the short summer night has shown you. Is your heart wild with magic and freedom? Does the earth dance under your feet in flight? Have you discovered how when life is strong within you, the sky is dusted with silver and the mountain stream draws gold from the moon? To honor you? Have you seen the girl whose limbs leap clothed in light by the rock where the waters part? Have you resolved what is hidden under sleep? Then listen to the owl hooting in the forest. How softly he calls his prey to the darkness of death. Beware, my friend. It is a call from the hunger of your own heart. Come closer, Paris. Let me see your face. Remember always that in yourself you are nothing. Blood is everything. It was Priam who made you a prince. But as long as you are loyal to me, I will protect you and love you. If the gods hear you now, will they not be angry that you loved me and did not kill me? Either the gods wished you to survive and so they brought it about, or else I must believe that the gods are malicious and destructive, that they have rewarded me with this moment only to punish me later. I will not believe that fate or the gods work to our harm, or that they condemn us for loving our own. You are my natural father, yet you had no love for me. You abandoned me to die at the hour of my birth. The herdsman, Anacreon, who raised me and educated me, had not enough even for himself, yet he gave me half of everything which was his. You are quick-tempered, as your mother was. But I praise you because you speak not like a slave, but like a free man. Hector, my son, 
tell this boy what it was like to be the child of Priam? He never spared me. Even the games I played, he counterweighted against me. He hoped by favoring adversity to make me stronger. He was not like a father. He was always a king. My son, I am not a cruel man. I did what I did, not for my sake or for yours, but for the sake of the city. You say you are not a cruel man. Well, how then did you build Troy? Can a man without cruelty do what you have done? It fell to me to alter the pattern of the centuries. If we believe it is our destiny to live forever upon hard ground, under an open sky at the mercy of the weather and the seasons, then it is our minds which are at fault, not our bodies. I knew that these things were not necessities, and accordingly I changed them. Look. Below us, the city is sleeping. If an enemy comes against Troy, that is the way he will come, over the horizon, out of the waves. I built Troy's walls thick and wide. But Troy's children must be stronger than their father. I am to be married to Etion's daughter, the Greek princess Andromache. Her birth is royal, her lineage older even than ours. My firstborn son will mingle his blood only with the highest and best. What of me? You. Am I not also at an age to be married? You will leave, Troy. I shall send you away. You have told us that life is hard for those who are born poor. I tell you this, it will be harder for you as my son. You will go as my envoy to the court of Menelaus, the red-headed king of Sparta, who desires closer ties with Troy. Because you are young and lack experience, Menelaus will try to better you in any way he can. Bring back from your meeting some prize, some result, to show me that you are more than a village boy. And according to what you achieve, so will I reward you. His name is Paris. He is the son of Priam and has come as Priam's ambassador to the court of my husband, Menelaus, king of Sparta. Tonight at dinner, Menelaus, who was drunk, spilled wine on the table. Paris dipped his finger in the wine and with it, he wrote my name upon the surface of the wood. Menelaus noticed nothing of this, only shouted to his cupbearer to refill the cups. Without raising my head to look at him, I wiped away what Paris had written, then rose and left the hall. Now, whenever I drink or eat or work or try to sleep, there is a knot, like fear, in the pit of my stomach. Sir, welcome to Sparta. Sir, I thank you. Sparta is a small kingdom, a mountain kingdom. We lack Troy's wealth. Yet we are strong and at peace because we count Troy among our friends. Sir, my father commands me to say that Troy is honoured to be Sparta's friend. <laughs> I have done business with Troy since the days of my boyhood, but I've never seen it. It is said, sir, that Troy is a city overflowing with munificence, where slaves are as numerous as flies in summer, where Priam's gold coin comes warm each day from the mint-like bread from a bakery. 
And where every citizen keeps a table as lavish as a king's. Sir. By our position, we stand between east and west, commanding the sea. Yet, we prefer to make ourselves rich, not by war, but by trafficking. Sir, a time for war is coming. Troy has done well, but she must understand that wealth is worth nothing without strength. And my father Atreus was called a pirate. But by warfare, he and his confederates humiliated Memphis and Thebes and took from the pharaoh Merempta corn enough for ten winters. Since I became its king, this nation has fought no wars. I have preferred to codify the law and see it obeyed. For too long, these islands have been riven by tribal dissension. The chieftains who govern fight too easily amongst themselves. But my brother Agamemnon and I have learned from Troy what unity can mean to a nation. Sparta is a stronghold, not a city. Here, our life is frugal, and as a people, we are praised most for our austerity. I say to Priam, your father... That since our interests do not conflict, let us bind ourselves closer in an alliance of strength. Let Troy and Sparta control these islands and the seas beyond them. Troy is a great power. She has in plenty the necessaries which Sparta needs. In return, Sparta will provide to secure Troy's interest here upon the mainland, a force of fighting men loyal to Troy and to Priam, its king. So I will report what you have said to Priam, my father. I am obliged to delay our conference. News came this morning from Crete. My grandfather's brother, Catrius, the old king, died in his sleep three days ago. I barely knew the man, but I must travel to Crete to see him buried and to preside at the funeral games. I will be gone only a short time. Treat my house and everything in it as your own. I leave my wife, Helen, under your protection. Sir, I am honoured by your trust. Once I thought that to feel upon my face the sharp, exhilarating sting of the wind as it brought ice down out of the air from Ida's high slopes, or to stand by the pool where salmon leap in summer and listen to the murmuring of the air as it corrugates the water, or to lie solitary in the long grass and observe above the moon rising over the trees as silent and cold as a fish, was worth more than a woman's love. But then, in my boyhood, in a dream, I saw a woman's limbs and eyes, breasts and legs, touched warm skin and could feel between my fingers her thick, dark hair. I thought that she was a goddess. Then I thought that her name was Inoni. All of my life, her voice has been calling to me. Sir, my husband left Sparta at dawn and would be gone ten days. In his absence, he instructs me to make you welcome. Madam, it is an honor to be at your disposal. You are Queen of Sparta. I know what authority and power lies in that title. So why do you flatter me? I am Queen of Sparta, but in myself I am nothing. My husband gives me name and title. Everything I own or am belongs to him or his estate. Yet you must know that for 30 years, my father, King Tyndareus, ruled in Sparta. Menelaus is a stranger here. He came for me and for the crown he got by marrying me, according to the ancient custom which Spartan kings revere as law. Until I was 10 years old, I believed I lived the happiest life on earth. After that time, I was courted in love, sought as a prize desired as a living gift. But the more men desired me, the colder I became. 
Madam, you were wrong to say that you are nothing. You are Helen. You are the daughter of Leda and Tindareos. All of your life stories have been told about you to account for your beauty. It is said that when Leda, your mother, married your father, the gods pitied her because she was so lovely and your father already so old. It is said that on her wedding night, Leda became the lover of Zeus himself and that you and your sister, Clytemnestra, are the twin children of their union. Is that what you have heard? I do not say that it is true. I understand that I am beautiful, but it has brought me no contentment. I remember how on the day we were 14 years old, Clytemnestra and I were summoned to see my father. He told us that we had reached marriageable age and must, henceforth, have husbands. In the negotiations which followed, Clytemnestra was given to Agamemnon, the elder son of Atreus, ruler of Argos. Menelaus, his younger son, got me and after my father's death, my father possessing no male heir to succeed him, the crown of Sparta itself. Atreus and his sons are descendants of a tribe foreign to this nation. Atreus seized the throne of Argos by force and held it until his death with brutal persistence. But Menelaus, his son, has never been a brutal man. On our wedding night, his fear of me was so great that when he gripped my shoulders and said to me, now you must undress, his hands were shaking. Madam, why do you speak your most private thoughts to me as if you and I were lovers already? Sir, you are not ignorant of why. I am not naive. You're not the first to praise me or my beauty. It's vanity in you to think that I would dishonor so lightly and so easily a man who puts all his faith and trust in my integrity. You insult him, but you praise him for his trust. You loathe his body, but you lack the will to leave his bed. All my life, the eyes of men have followed me. Since my earliest days, I have been gazed upon with an intensity you could never comprehend. I recognize the heat, the insanity threatened by a glance, the possessiveness or contempt concealed in the gentleness of a hand. I do not ask you to be my lover briefly and in secret while your husband is away. I ask you to be my wife, to be mine openly not furtively, to come with me to Troy, where you will never be my property, but will live free as a free-born woman. What you say to me, you say only to further the achievement of your own selfish pleasure. If you do not love me, my life is ended. Inform your husband when he returns what I have said to you or tried to do, and he will take my life. But of this be certain, Helen, I will not leave Sparta without you. Sir, let me live as my condition compels me to live. You know well that to break the oaths of marriage would show only contempt for heaven and the gods who watch over us. The gods led me here. The gods showed me your face. I knew you existed but did not know how to find you. In the mountains, the gods cannot be seen. But I felt them always. Their eyes were watching me. Their minds weighing me and judging me. That is why they have led me out of a village where I lived in poverty to a great city where I stand at the side of a great king. Now they have brought me by miraculous means to Sparta, where it seems that my heart has always been. Oh, Helen, you know that love has no reason or sense. It lies deep in the blood and is roused like thunder from a summer sky. I have lived a life never knowing mental rest, always searching for what my dreams have revealed, the face of a woman whom I will love until I die. 
Oh gods. Oh heaven. What will follow from our adultery? Oh, when I consider the ruin of my husband's honest happiness, I weep for every bride and groom. I find that oaths are nothing. It is the folly of our youth to make light vows which are lightly broken. I swore before heaven a lifelong mutual faith, yet I forsake it at a stranger's touch. When you would not hear me and refuse my keepsakes, I prayed that Aphrodite would turn me into a rose so you could pluck me with your delicate, agile fingers and put me between <laughs> your breasts. <laughs> At night, in my despair, I often dreamed I was the gentle air discovering you naked after a bath, and with my breath drying your limbs and hair. Come to me and set me free from sour-hearted melancholy. What my soul desires to be, O oh, Aphrodite, make of me. I was a gannet, and I caught you like a fish. I was a bear, and I found you in the woods. I was a horse, and I allowed you onto my back. I was a bird, and I flew to your outstretched hand. I was an acrobat, and I danced for you. I was a conjurer, and I gave you the world in a painted lacquer box. I was a god, and I came to you by night in the likeness of an angel. I was a flame and I burnt you. I am smoke and I will not leave your room. I am wind and I burst in at your window. I am water and I cool and soothe your forehead. You alone are real. All other things are imaginary and will pass. I learned. You have taken ship to Troy, leaving behind you everything which was yours. You are left in the arms of a man who seemed to me truthful and worthy of trust. I learn he did not force you, but flattered you. He spoke beguiling words, and you believed them. All my life, I have longed for hearth and home and a quiet bed to be at peace with the gods and the spirits of the earth. I hoped in due time to be the father of a son and to hold a daughter in my arms before I was old. And now, Everything is destroyed. <laughs> I never hurt you. And you wanted for nothing. I strove always to increase your happiness. I felt no need in your sight to be a great king or a great man. Yet to you, I was of less significance than the pet bird, which is the only possession you have taken with you to Troy. Everything ends. The linnet's nest is ransacked and the mother's eggs are smashed by robber birds. The bear returns to his lair, but the she-bear has been torn apart by hounds and the place where they took their rest is befouled by blood. The cicada, which sang all summer, watches its home cut to pieces by the reapers and trembles at the edge of the harvested field. seen in half a century. The walls 
and towers of Troy. It is truly said that this city was built by Apollo to be a beacon to the world. You and your people have filled it with happiness and light. Do you come to Troy of your own free will? I do. What promises has my son made to you? He has made no promises, Priam, except his hand in marriage, if you will permit it. How can he marry you? By order of law, Menelaus is your husband. By my actions, I have annulled the marriage. I am Hector. I am Priam's eldest son and the heir to his throne. Tell us why you have come to Troy. I come to Troy because I've heard that Troy is free and fearless. I come to claim by marriage the freedom which is the birthright of every well-born Trojan woman. In Troy, no human life is sacrificed to the gods. In Troy, even a slave cannot be executed without due process of law. By your example, you have taught the world what the world should be. I cannot return to Sparta. Spartan law would take my life for what I have done. I ask for your protection. I am Andromache. I am Hector's wife. I mean you no disrespect, but you're a child. You know nothing of what we are or believe or what is needful for Troy and its people to live at peace under the law. You are wrong to be self-willed. I must tell you that before our wedding day, Hector and I had never met. Yet to me, he has become my perfect image of a man. If you could not find happiness at your husband's side, you might have sought comfort in a life of obedience, honouring your husband's household, raising his children. You were not ill-treated, and were never denied the rights and privileges appropriate to your rank. But it seems you had no care for a husband's humiliation. I believe in the gods. I fear them and love them. I think we were put upon this earth to love and to learn how to love. Heaven brought Paris to Sparta. I did not ask it. I never prayed for it. It happened. Menelaus will come for you, Helen. When it falls to me to ask the people of Troy to spill their blood in Troy's defense, or else be destroyed, what will I say to them? Men do not go to war over women. They go to war for reasons of their own. By your position, you command the Propontic Sea. Trade routes are open to any nation strong enough to seize and hold them. Agamemnon and Manelaos are greedy for empire. I know the island chieftains. They will fight. Yes, they will fight. Because fighting is all they know. Their wives despise them, and so they go to war. You bring this girl to Troy, making promises to her out of love, which only the expenditure of Trojan blood in war can guarantee. Menelaos demands 200,000 gold pieces in restitution, or else the return of Helen to Sparta. He demands tribute in perpetuity, or else he will go to war. You have done what was never possible before. You have united the barbarian tribes against us. At a bay in Aulis, they've anchored their ships. Agamemnon has mustered the clan chiefs. He's made them pledge to wage holy war against the race of King Priam, which insults his brother, his household, and his gods. Do not doubt that war is coming. The young, the ambitious, the brave are tired of living in a world made dull by peace. They're saying, let us purge the bad blood in a war of conquest. Troy's insolence must be scoured from the surface of the earth. Do not think me a coward because I say that I fear them. Only a fool would not fear these warships, these weapons, these battalions of armed men, these horses, these chariots, these beaked black ships. Only a fool would not fear their eagerness, their pride, their belief that fate and the gods fight at their side. <clears throat> what you say is true. Menelaus must go to war or accept openly the humiliation I have offered him. If he does not fight, he makes himself ridiculous. If he fights but cannot win, then he and his brother's family, the family of Atreus, are finished. Sparta and Argos often sought our friendship, but in secret they despised us. In secret they thought that they could do together what Priam has done alone. Let us remember that Priam's empire, for all its peaceable character, is ruled by fear, and that all subjects are unwilling subjects. Our greatness is founded not upon virtue, but upon strength. 
Those who love us and applaud us now will rise against us as soon as they think that we are too weak to control them. We have become an imperial power. And for us, there is only one destiny, to grow in strength or to fall, to consolidate our power by fresh conquest or to yield to our enemies everything we have achieved. My son, you speak now as I did 30 years ago. This woman is not worth a single Trojan life. She is the pretext and not the cause. The cause is empire and command of the sea. If we give them war, we give them what they want, and they will use the advantage. If we make a treaty, Agamemnon will disperse his army, and the treaty can be broken later. They will not make a treaty. At Aulis, five days ago, Agamemnon put to death his daughter, Iphigenia. She was, or was reputed to have been, his favourite child, but he killed her without hesitation at the behest of Apollo's high priest, who promised him that in return for a virgin's blood, heaven would grant his army a just and honourable victory. At once, the wind changed. The fleet set sail. Agamemnon's men believe they can do no wrong. I cry for judgment. Iphigenia was my sister's firstborn daughter. I did not know that she had been slaughtered. Our lives have been ruined by these brothers who think it is a contemptible thing to live in peace. Did no one stand in Agamemnon's way? Did no one fight to save her? Their crimes are disgusting. Let them die here, under your walls like cattle. You were born and bred in Sparta, but in your heart you are a Trojan. I grant you protection as my daughter by marriage. What you have said today does honor to our city. When I was a young man, I defeated the island races who attacked and burned Troy. I showed no mercy and took no prisoners. I stained the beaches and the sea with their blood. I am an old man now. I have grown to love peace and the fruits of peace. But war does not come when we want it to come. If we love peace too much, then we fear to go to war. If this struggle had not come in my time, it would have come in yours or your children's. We gain nothing by trying to postpone it. What we have made for ourselves inside this city is better than what others have made anywhere ever. But if Troy cannot stand against the world, Troy is not safe in the world. And the world will destroy it. So let us fight. Have you ever seen a hawk hang motionless in the air? So is fate above mortal men and women. In part one of Troy by Andrew Rissick, Achilles was played by Toby Stevens, Aegistos by James Hayes, Agamemnon by Oliver Cotton, and Anacreon by Ian Hogg. Andromache was played by Emma Fielding, Electra by Cassandra Sperry, Hikabi by Deborah Findlay, Hector by Michael Maloney, Helen by Geraldine Somerville, and Hermes by Paul Schofield. With Lindsay Duncan as Clytemnestra, James Lawrenson as Menelaus, Geoffrey Whitehead as Nicanor, Abigail Doherty as Enoni, Jean-Marc Perret as Orestes, and Michael Sheen as Paris. Saeed Jeffrey was Parmenian, David Harewood Patroclus, Julian Glover King Priam, and Eleanor Bronn Thetis.
The singer was Mia Suteriu, and the producer was Jeremy Mortimer. 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 Jeremy Mortimer.